After being brought together by a vicious serial killer, Graydon Jones and Terry Smith found their lives entangled. These two unlikely friends have been on a journey through the dark, gothic heart of the South, following in the footsteps of guts, blood, and tongues. This is the final leg of their walkabout. Giblets. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem, killers, cannibals, and cults, fearful fiction and furious fact, tall tales, and terrible truths. This is a scary home companion. A hop and a skip north of Tallahassee in the Florida Panhandle. Graydon Jones and Terry Smith were ambling down a dark stretch of two-lane highway. And that's when they saw the wreck. This was very late at night, as the two hard-traveling teens tended to avoid paved roads during the daylight hours. It's too hot. It's too full of watching eyes. The duo had been traveling the south on foot for some months now, This was not the first time that they had come across a car accident, but never before had they seen one this fresh. The twisted chunk of steel and glass was still crackling with little tongues of fire. The metal framework was still clicking and clacking and clinking as it settled into a new shape. There was a smoldering corpse strapped into the driver's seat. Both hands melted to the wheel. A man in a long leather duster and a wide-brimmed hat stood at the top of the embankment, looking down like a, a hunter making sure his prey was dead. He smoked a cigarette and did not seem at all bothered by the cuts on his face and neck. You okay, mister? Graydon asked him. The man said, amiably enough, been better, been worse. He stared at the flames framed in drifting smoke. How you boys been? He didn't look at them, but they both got the impression this man knew exactly who they were. We've been good, thanks, Terry said. You need any help? After a moment, the man shook his head. Nah, y'all best be moving. Tell you what, though. You see Bill, you tell him I said howdy. Graydon and Terry gave each other a quick, worried glance and then kept walking. The man saw how nervous they were, and he chuckled at them. And then he called out, You've been on the road long enough. The road knows who you are. They didn't look back. They kept walking until they were around the bend and out of his sight, and then they left the pavement behind. Shit like that was exactly why they avoided roads. For the most part, because they had to eat. It's not like they could hunt. So they always had to stay nearby the roads. Over the last few months, they have both become fans of all-night diners and like to slip inside during that dead zone of 4 to 5 a.m. They would get coffee and whatever food they could afford, clean up in the washroom a little bit, and Graydon would jot down the day's events in his little notebook. 
He always kept this notebook with him, that and a little pencil. Carried them in a Ziploc bag to make sure they stayed dry. And so it was the following night when they passed through a small, sleepy Florida town called Lloyd and found a greasy spoon with the neon lights still flashing. There was one car in the lot out front, an unmarked black sedan. Inside, there was one customer, a face they recognized. The boys had only met DRO Special Agent Bill Handel once, but the somber, emotionless man made a lasting impression on them. Hello, gentlemen, Bill said as they walked in. Have a seat. A ghost of a waitress delivered menus and glasses of icy cold water. They both chugged them down greedily. Graydon asked, Are you here for us? No. I mean, no, I'm not here to force you to go someplace with me. I just happen to be in the area. I thought I would check in on the both of you. And I wanted to ask Terry if he was ready to go home yet. Terry shrugged. What home? How could he go back there? The agent slid him a card with a phone number on it. When you're ready, I can smooth things over back in Abilene. can make sure no one asks too many questions. Terry took the card. Okay. Why? Bill said, I used to do a piece of business with your father. I thought you might want to uphold that family tradition. Terry flinched at the thought of his family's traditions. But he just said thanks and pocketed the card. They ate a hearty breakfast, which Bill paid for. He offered them a ride, but they declined. As they left, he asked them, Have you boys seen a hitchhiker out there? Tall man, long leather coat, wide hat. Graydon nodded. We did. He said to tell you howdy. They walked away, hearing the straight-faced agent swearing under his breath. Son of a bitch. They continued south, through softly clawing undergrowth, and on till sunset, when they stopped to make camp under an abandoned overpass. Where are we going next? Terry asked. I heard about a place. I thought it might be neat to check out. What place? Well, it's a town that was settled by an uprising of circus freaks like 150 years ago. Terry, have you ever heard the story of the Coyote Princess? Terry and Graydon spent three more days walking south through the swampy backwoods of north-central Florida, which is significantly less fun than it sounds. Terry had never been this far south before, so far south that you leave the south and enter a soggy, boggy, damp, dank slice of the wild west which was hotter than hell and humid enough to make the devil take five. They had a new reason to avoid the roads now. 
the afternoon rain bursts, which fell on pavement that was so hot that the raindrops immediately turned to steam and the all of outdoors felt like a wet sauna. And that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part of Florida is the bugs. The goddamn bugs. A wave of pestilence more fearsome than any horseman. Mosquitoes, no fire ants, sand fleas, deer flies, wasps, hornets, and of course bees, which were not yet Africanized, but there had been talks. This was a quiet stretch of time. The boys saw nothing interesting, encountered nothing unusual. So Graydon had nothing to write in his notebook. Which, at this point, he felt was a good thing. That notebook was running out of space. He'd been working on filling it for months now, and he was almost done. There would be more notebooks in the future. He knew that. But this was his first one. It was important. When it was filled up, it would be time to start a new one, not just a new notebook, but a new chapter. And he didn't really want to think about that. He was still enjoying this chapter. But he was Graydon Jones, the latest of his name. And his family had their ways. Older than the bloodline, as old as time, the Jones clan were different from other families. They had different customs. They had different responsibilities. One of those customs was leaving home at a certain age and going on walkabout, following your instincts, writing down what you find, adding to history by chronicling it. This is what Graydon had been doing, a journey that started with him being kidnapped, with his belly torn open and had taken him a very long way from that point. Graydon did his best to enjoy the steps that he and Terry had left. He didn't know what to expect in this place, this village, this swamp, and he wasn't expecting any kind of answer by any means, but he was hoping for some kind of sign. It was coming up on Thanksgiving, after all, and long ago he had read in one of his grandfather's notebooks that if you were in Florida and needed a good meal, go to Coal Kettle Swamp, otherwise known by the locals as Haka Pana Wakata, place of long shadows. It was two clicks west of the bloody banks of the Echo River, which was better known as the Swanee River. The Bloody Banks were a historical site where soldiers led by future United States President Andrew Jackson brutally slaughtered an entire village of the Seminole tribe. The description of the Bloody Banks was enough to go on because in this case, there were no maps of the area. A verbal description of where to go was the best that you could find. Coal Kettle Swamp had never appeared on any official maps of Florida. For a very good reason. Back in the day, the day of the Bloody Banks, the map makers all worked for the military. And there had been a lot of serious scraps with the tribes in Florida. And by this point, the soldiers, they were worn out. They were tired. They were diseased, a little worn out from all this bloodshed. The whole Seminole War was winding down, and it was decided that they weren't going to go any further south. Once they had finished taking and mapping out the place they called Coal Kettle Swamp, on account of how black it got at night, 
they would be allowed to head back north to civilization and out of godforsaken Florida once and for all. But this one little piece of swamp, this place, well, they couldn't take it and they couldn't map it. The land itself was the enemy. And the soldiers were starting to believe the rumors about the shadow people that lived out deep in the heart of the bayou. No one wanted to map out the area. The soldiers, the brass, the cartographers, they all just wanted to go home. So they erased it. The map makers altered the official maps, and the brass signed off on it. It was just little tweaks, just moving the lines to hide this swamp. Because if the generals didn't know about the swamp, then they wouldn't keep sending men into it. A few strokes of the pencil, and Coal Kettle Swamp was off the maps. The maps that served as the basis for official maps for the state of Florida and for the country. Since it had been hidden, state officials never attempted to put any roads through that area or even to survey it. Why would they? It didn't exist. And that is just how the residents of Coal Kettle Swamp liked it. Graydon and Terry found the Suwannee River and followed the banks south. When they found the spot of the massacre, the Bloody Banks, they turned due west. Although they were by now experienced travelers, even in inhospitable terrain, they found the wilds of the Florida swamps to be quite challenging. It was slow going. Their sweat ran heavy, and bugs treated their exposed skin like a breakfast buffet. What are we looking for next? Terry asked. I, I don't know. We just walk until we see something. It took almost two hours to traverse the two muddy, mucky clicks. But then they did see something. More specifically, someone. He couldn't have been much older than the two of them but he was a gargantuan young man. He wore triple XL-sized bib overalls that were straining at the seams. His torso, arms, and bare feet were covered in hair so thick and tangled that the hungry bugs couldn't dig through it. He was smoking a joint and didn't seem surprised at all to see these two young men emerged from the brush nearby. It wasn't until they approached him they noticed the incredibly foul stench that he had. What they initially thought was the pungent, skunky funk of homegrown pot smoke was in fact just this teenager's B.O. Y'all lost? he asked them. Y'all look lost. I don't think so, Graydon said. I'm Graydon. This is Terry. We're looking for the village. The big man nodded, finished his joint. Cool. My name's Twee Bruce. I guess I'll show you all around if you want. Twee. Wee Bruce asked them, y'all get anything to drink? But they did not. That's all right, 
We need to swing by my place anyway. And then I'll show you the town. A town? Terry asked. Based on the legends, Graydon had told him Terry was expecting some kind of hobo camp. Well, not a town like you're used to. A village, like you said. It's closer to the truth. I just... I never much like that. I don't feel like a, a villager. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be a villager. More than anything... Graydon wanted to take out his notebook and start writing, but he held back. There was precious little space left, and he needed to see how the day was going to unfold. They cut across a land bridge and went deeper into the swamp. Twee Bruce's huge feet and webbed toes had him strolling along carefree while the boys had to use their hands to pull their feet out of the muck. After a short walk, the ground dried out, became more firm, and the undergrowth thinned out. Gray hustled to keep pace with Tweed Bruce, but Terry found himself lagging behind. That's when he heard the snap of a branch. He looked around, saw a glimpse of something tall and shaggy darting behind a tree took a tentative step forward. Hello? he asked. The shape emerged, much closer now, and suddenly a swamp beast was coming right towards Terry. It was easily eight feet tall, naked as a jaybird, covered head to toe in dark, matted fur. It grunted. It lunged. Its enormous cock swung back and forth like some kind of furry truncheon on an old-timey policeman's belt. And my God, the stink of it! It stung Terry's eyes, made the bile rise in his throat, and he knew what this was. Graydon! he shouted, It's a goddamn skunk ape! The creature stopped and growled. Gray and Bruce appeared moments later. Jesus Christ, Twee Bruce sighed, rubbing his hairy jaws. Listen, man, we don't say that around here, okay? You wouldn't. Like me calling you a cracker ass, would you? I, uh... Fuck. I'm... I'm sorry? Maybe I was intimidated by your penis. The skunk ape laughed and extended a massive hand. Yeah, sorry about that. We're naturalists. And that means we don't like clothes in our family. Terry shook the man's hand and introduced himself. I'm Twee Gary, he said in a deep, rumbly voice. This is my dad, Bruce offered. I'm sorry, Pops. I just, I found these guys. I figured they were here for Thanksgiving. You are? Twee Gary asked them. Yes, sir, Graydon confirmed. Suddenly, very confident. Yes, we are here for Thanksgiving. My granddad told me, said y'all were good folk. Hospitable to travelers and outcasts, I think is what he said. Graydon and Terry continued on with Bruce just a short distance when they stopped by the Twee residence. It was a cracker-style house set high on stilts and supported by two different trees that grew beside and through the walls. A long rope ladder was nailed to one of the trees and Bruce scurried up it with remarkable agility for someone of his size. Catch, 
he shouted and started to toss down a series of partially filled plastic milk jugs. As he climbed down, Twee Bruce explained it was his job to bring the moonshine to the feast. The Twee family was apparently locally famous for their whiskey. Twee've been moonshiners ever since we moved down here. I mean, think about it. Big, hairy, naked, monstery looking dudes who smell bad. That is the perfect cover for a still. The two boys helped their new friend carry his bounty through another low-lying strip of boggy earth. And then they found themselves at the edge of a little village. All Graydon could think to say was, Wow! Terry echoed that sentiment. After he finished sneaking a quick sip of liquid lightning from a milk jug, Bruce held his arms open wide, as if making formal introductions between the boys and the village. The story goes that once we found this place, the Coyote Princess said the one and only word anyone ever heard her say. She said, home. So that's why we stayed put, and that's what we call it. Welcome home, fellas. There wasn't much to this place called home, which was more or less a scattering of handmade buildings alongside a well-kept dirt road, with dozens more roofs half-hidden in the surrounding tree line. The houses might have been aged and made from the trees of the swamp, but they were sturdy. They were painted, they were rigged with satellite dishes and power lines. An old-timey Mayberry type of place, easing its way into modern times. There were not many other people about, but everyone that Gray and Terry saw seemed to be heading in the same direction. The feast is always held at the saloon. The saloon used to belong to Arlo Rex, you know, world's tallest albino. Arlo left it to his daughter. She wasn't an albino. She wasn't even tall. Twee Bruce was in full walking tour guide mode at this point and joined Terry in pulling sips of moonshine as they moseyed down Main Street. Arlo... He was one of the town founders, but he never took a official position. He just liked playing cards and serving drinks. Professor Fatface, he was our first elected mayor. That there, that's old city hall. Graydon asked, is that built over a swimming pool? Yeah. Professor Fatface couldn't hold himself upright after a while. Mostly he just floated. A few years later, the Man O.T. family moved in, and they've been there for three generations. A manatee family? A, f a family of manatees? No, the Man O.T. family. Bob and Carol and the girls. Ah, oh, shit, you're confused. Okay, so back in the day with these people, with my people, a lot of them didn't have real names. They were... They were basically slaves, bought and sold by circuses and doctors. But a lot of them, they kept those old names, you know what I mean? Made them our own. So, the man O.T. just kept that as his last name. Is that where the twee comes from? Graydon asked. Yep. Great Grandma. She was called the Fantastic Yetwe of the Orient. Goddamn stupid name, you ask me. She was from Illinois, not the Orient. And they misspelled Yeti as Yetwe. Anyway, Grandma liked it, you know, made her famous. So she kept the name, and here we are. Terry offered Graydon a sip of moonshine. 
He screwed his face up into a question at that bitter, awful taste. What is that? Is that, ch is that blue cheese? Terry laughed. Suddenly he was feeling lightheaded. That's what I thought. It's got notes of pepper jack cheese, doesn't it? Twee Bruce shook his head. Nah, that's the palmetto you're tasting. We used to use the swamp cabbage. That was good. Now we use the palmetto. I don't care for the flavor. But my fuck, it'll get you some drunk. They continued around the bend in the dirt road and saw its terminus at the old saloon. The last few stragglers were all going in through the front doors. Twee Bruce went inside as well, but the boys, they lingered on the front steps. The outside of the building had been painted in a series of murals recreating old sideshow banners. Terry and Gray slowly walked around the outside of the building, taking in snapshots of the history of home. Arlo Rex, the world's tallest albino. Professor Fatface, smartest and fattest man alive. The Missing Link. The Fantastic Yetwe of the Orient. Snake Hands, otherworldly magician. The Magnificent Man O.T. Hard Knocks, Molly Fierce, the toughest woman alive. Ma Gator, the alligator woman. Ned the Geek, the Mummy, the Human Torso, and the Coyote Princess. Each of the murals was signed in paint, either words or just a mark, by each of the descendants of that person. All the pictures were heavily signed in mark, except for the Coyote Princess. That one stayed respectfully blank beneath the painting of her beside her one true love, the Wolf King. Graydon and Terry stepped inside the front doors where they found everyone waiting for them. The old saloon had been redecorated with wreaths and bundles of swamp flowers on the walls. The gambling tables converted into banquet tables, adorned with a mishmash of handmade plates, cups, and dishes. If the table settings were a bizarre collection, then that word doesn't quite capture the oddity and diversity sitting around the tables. A veritable smorgasbord of exotic humanity in all its horror and glory. The big tables were all full, as were a dozen smaller side tables. Even two of the walls were standing room only, people packed in shoulder to shoulder, holding their own plates. When Bruce set the moonshine jugs down on the table, a cheer went up. Twee Bruce! Said one and all, either in words or something approximate. Wait, where's the rest of it? Asked the leathery man at the head of the table. And then the boys emerged, and you could have heard a pin drop. The place was so Every person at the table turned to stare right at Graydon and Terry. Dozens of faces, most human, some only vaguely so. But in every age and manner and color and 
texture of skin and eye and hair. There were a varying number of appendages and digits and conditions that seemed to afflict many of them. But not all of them. Not even half. Most of them looked like normal folks. Or normal enough, anyway. This was Florida, after all. Terry was a touch closer to three sheets than he intended. And he got misty-eyed when he looked around and realized that these were all normal folks, no matter what they looked like. He stepped forward and dropped his whiskey jugs on the table. Graydon did likewise. And a cheer went up. New guys! Said one and all, either in words or something approximate. And then a space opened up for two extra chairs at the banquet table. Twee Bruce handed out whiskey jugs to all the various side tables, then plopped down right between Graydon and Terry. Who's that? Graydon asked, pointing with his chin at the unusual man who seemed to be presiding over the feast. Oh, that's the mayor. Send you Mike. Terry whispered, He looks like his skin is made out of Slim Jims. Twee Bruce licked his lips. I know, right? <laughs> Yummy. What? You're not into guys? Nah, uh, not really, man, Terry said. I'm not really into anyone. Oh, okay, that, that's cool. I just, I just, you know, saw y'all together, figured you were, you know, together, together. There was quail. There was duck. And turkey. And bear meat. Rabbit. And something that Terry hoped was a possum. There was corn and yams and greens and peas and okra and a corn gruel called softkey, which was absolutely fucking delightful. The food was good. Company was better. Graydon understood why his family liked this place. It wasn't just called home. It felt like home. The people were friendly, not aggressively so, but Gray shook hands or bumped shoulders with so many people that he lost count. Terry got quiet. He was polite, of course, but all this was making him turn inward. He'd never known a feeling like this before. As great as it was, it was overwhelming to finally find home. Gray sat back down next to him. You okay, Terry Bear? Send you Mike, the long, lanky man whose skin looked like sausage casing, tapped a knife against his water glass, and everyone quickly fell silent. As your mayor, it is my solemn duty to give the traditional speech. I'm just kidding around, you guys. You know how much I love to talk. That's why you're going to elect me again this March, right? Sidney Mike didn't get as much applause as he was expecting, so he plowed right ahead with his speech. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, ladies and gentlemen. Everything that we have, and, and we have so, so much, is because our families struggled, strived, suffered, and died. All so that we could have this. We honor them every day. And we do that with how we live, with how we treat each other, Today's special, isn't it? It's a day, it's a day to reflect. It's 
day to smile. Because when we reflect on home, it's hard not to smile, isn't it? Our people, our families, outcasts, freaks, monsters. And then we fought. And we won, and we struck back, and we came here. We made our own place. It would have been so easy to close out the rest of the world, but did we do that? Hell no, we didn't. When African Americans fled into the swamp to hide from the white mobs, we took them in. When native tribes got slaughtered by the military, we found the survivors. We took them in. To this very day, we are still taking people in. He nodded to the boys. And we do this with love and hospitality. Because anything else would denigrate what our people have done for us. No one picks where they come from. No one picks what they look like, what their name is. Hell, we don't get to choose much in life, do we? As Arlo Rex once said, like it or not, you play the hand you're dealt. For better or worse, all of our lives are built on the bones of our ancestors. All of us. He looked at the boys again. So I say, let's do them proud. Everyone who was capable of raising a glass did so. Graydon and Terry clinked their earthenware mugs together. They looked at one another, and they both saw the future written on the face of the other. It was bittersweet just like the tea that they sipped. This day, this meal, this place, this speech, it was important. It was a message, one they could both read bright and clear. Terry blurted out, I'm going to miss you, man. Yeah. Me too. But it's just for now, right? Graydon nodded. Yeah, it's just for a while. You're my brother, Terry. You'll always be my brother. They finished their meal quietly. Then Gray slipped outside to finish filling out the last page of his notebook. Although that would be a poetic place to stop, that wasn't the end of Terry and Graydon. They spent the next two days in home. They slept in hammocks, went fishing with Twee Bruce, and learned a lot more about the residents of the village. And then it was time. They hugged and left the swamp in different directions. Graydon went east to Gainesville, where he found the massive downtown local library. On the lowest level of that library, behind a storage room next to the children's nonfiction section, Graydon found what he was looking for a door that didn't exist. He turned the knob, went inside, and gently closed it behind him. He was in another library now. But not just a library, the library. It's called the Archive. Terry walked for a few hours. But the first gas station that he found proved to be his end point. Now that Graydon wasn't with him, Terry didn't want to keep walking. So he fished out that business card, and he called that number. 
Bill, it's Terry. I'm ready to work. Thank you for listening to another episode of Scary Home Companion. Find the show on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or contact us directly at a scary home companion at gmail.com. Better yet, sign up for the Scary Home Companion Patreon page. Bonus episodes, extra content resources to explore the world of the show and the many characters in it. Here's an example. This very episode actually has a different ending on Patreon, featuring a big, far-out twist that the producer and I decided to cut and save for a future episode. Check it out only on Patreon. Giblets was produced and edited by Jeff Davidson. And it featured some pretty incredible music. South by 8 Eye Spy. One Fine Day at the Circus by Pilsar. Music for an Underground Circus by Ergo Fizzmiz. The Swamp by Marwood Williams. The theme music, as always, by Chelsea Oxendine. And a special call out for the Twee Appreciation Song by Sam Egan. Who knew that the Twee family had their own theme music? I would be shocked if we didn't hear that song again at some point. Links to all these great artists are in the show notes. <laughs>